Paul Wheeler, Executive Director of the Michigan Masonic Charitable Foundation. And we're here today recording another segment in our Legacy Series, recording the histories of past Grand Masters of the Grand Lodge of Michigan. Today we have with us past Grand Master Wayne Turk, who was Grand Master of the Grand Lodge in 1990 and 91. Wayne, welcome. Thank you. We're going to start at the beginning. <laughs> Tell us where you were born. I was born in Felicity, Ohio. On January 1, 1929. And where is Felicity? <laughs> That's a good question because I've been all throughout Ohio and there's many people in Ohio that I've never heard of Felicity. But it's a small town uh, east of Cincinnati, uh, about three or four miles from the Ohio River. So southern Ohio. Southern Ohio. Tell me a little uh, bit about your parents. Um, my mother and father were born and raised in that community also. And, uh, Dad, uh, well, we were, we were never poor, but, well, and, and we always had a, had a roof over our head. We always had food on the table. But uh, it didn't get there by the means that you might think of today. Um, I don't know what my dad did in the first few years of my life, but we lived in a small, we lived in a farmhouse, old farmhouse, back about a quarter of a mile lane. Uh, I can remember after my first brother was born, uh, they had a small insurance policy on us that cost a dime a week. And the insurance agent came around every week to collect that dime. And this one particular day, mother saw him come into the drive into the driveway. She said, you boys get upstairs and keep your mouth shut. Don't want to hear a thing out of you. He came knocking on the door. No one was home. She did not have the dime to pay him. But we weren't poor. We had plenty to eat. Because Dad always raised a pig every year and raised a garden. And uh, we had a roof over our head. What more could you ask for? Yeah. <laughs> so Mom was a stay-at-home mom? Oh, yes. Took care of the kids? Yes. Okay. So what was your parents' names? Ralph and Mildred. Okay. So you mentioned you had a brother. Did you have other siblings? I have uh, three brothers. And where do you fit in the pecking order? I'm the first one. You're the oldest. <laughs> All right. Um, tell us about some other childhood memories. You mentioned the, uh, the dime. Well, I don't really have too many memories, per se, uh, until we moved to... Uh, into uh, Centerville, which was uh, where, where we eventually moved to. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, growing up. We didn't have TV. We didn't have, in fact, we didn't even have a radio that worked. Didn't have a telephone. So we got up in the morning and had breakfast, went outside, all day. So you and your brothers got along well? Very well. Good. We did. Good. So you mentioned that uh, you grew up in Felicity and then moved to Centerville. Is that where you spent most of your childhood then in Centerville? We moved to Centerville when I was about probably about five years old. Lived there for uh, a few years then we moved over to Miamisburg, Ohio and uh, two different homes over there before Dad finally, uh, I don't know whether he purchased it or whether Uncle Frank gave it to him, a uh, parcel of land back in Centerville. And, uh, they, and they built a home on that land, probably about 12 years old when we did that. And uh, that's, where we, that's, that's where we lived, grew up. Until we got married and moved away. <laughs> so where did you go to school? 
Centerville, Ohio, was the Centerville, Ohio, Centerville school system, and then the Miamisburg school system for just three years. Okay. Were you active in any uh, school activities, sports, band? Well, I tried to play on the basketball team. There were only 29 boys in the whole high school, so everybody was on the team. And uh, the same thing with baseball. And uh, we didn't have football at the time. We did have track. Uh, Mary's brother and I both ran, I don't I think the 480 or what, what could have been 480, I'm not sure, in high school. And we both crossed the finish line and survived. Okay. And that's all we could say about it. It's an accomplishment. But, but in baseball, uh, the only time I really got to play was when uh, the principal of the high school, who happened to turn out to be my father-in-law, or was the coach uh, occasionally, and uh, he would put, he made sure that everyone played. So I got to play when he was coach. <laughs> That's good. So after high school, did you go to any college or vocational school? Went to General Motors Institute. Was very fortunate. Uh, my parents really couldn't afford to send me to college necessarily, but uh, this uh, gentleman that lived in in Centerville, and uh, I went to school with his son. He was the I guess coordinator, whatever they wanted to call him, a recruiter for GMI students. And uh, so I mentioned it to him one day and he said, well, come on into my office and see me. I did. I got into GMI and that was uh, a co-op school, which meant I worked for eight weeks and uh, then worked Went to school for eight weeks and worked for eight weeks. And uh, the, the work period gave me enough money to pay for the tuition and room and board while I was at school. And uh, it was a very fine arrangement. And that, by the way, was one of the finest schools in the country. It was a, a very, very tough school. Uh, I apparently didn't have all the background that I needed for all the courses that they gave me. So I uh, failed two courses the first year, which uh, which meant that the, uh, the school recommended that I be dropped. But Frigidaire said, no, we like his work. We want him to complete his schooling. So I had 29 credit hours and 39 class hours that next semester. And the only way I was able to do it was I, I had joined a fraternity, uh, a small local fraternity, Alpha Delta, and uh, my brothers in that fraternity got me through college. But I got through with, uh, with good grades and, and uh, the rest is history with that. <laughs> Very good. How did you uh, first meet Mary? <laughs> well, we first met in the first grade of school. So you've known each other a couple of years? Just a couple of years. Okay. But uh, I don't know that we even uh, hardly knew that the other one existed until about the 11th grade. Then uh, I don't know what made her do it. But uh, maybe she was desperate, I don't know. But, but she uh, invited me to a Sadie Hawkins Day dance. And uh, I didn't even answer her right away. But a good friend uh, of both of us uh, met me in the hall one day and he says, you know, you really should go with her. She's a really a nice girl. So I did. We've never been apart since. <laughs> That's wonderful. So when did you guys get married then? September, September 11, 11, 1948. 1948. 
uh, a year uh, after, a year we're after, we're after, after we're after 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 she was uh, she was 18 years old uh, and had to get her, the permission of her of her father and uh, so we had gone to him uh, quite a while before that and he finally relented thought okay I guess you can so uh, she called me uh, I was at, I was at uh, school in the fraternity house and she called me on the only phone we had in the house out in the hallway and uh, about the first thing she said was uh, uh, dad's gonna let us get married when do you want to do it 10th through the 11th of September <laughs> well I guess uh, if I have a choice let's make it the 11th <laughs> one extra day <laughs> So, I know you have some children. Why don't you tell us about your children? Well, we have five children. We had uh, three boys. Uh, all born in, uh, in Ohio. And uh, then we moved to Michigan and had two girls. Must have been the water. It, was, it had to be the water. <laughs> but... Uh, they're, they're wonderful kids, kids, the oldest one is 61 now, but uh, they, we made sure that they all attended college, graduated from college. So they all have their degree. Uh, the oldest one uh, was, was a CPA, he's retired from that. The second one... Uh, is a doctor in the Navy and uh, rose to the uh, position of captain in the Navy. He retired before they made him admiral because he said, I don't want to sit behind a desk pushing a pencil. So I went to the doctor and he said, that's the only way I can keep from it is to retire. So he came home one day with his uh, Navy uniform on hung that in the cupboard, went to the, back the next day in civilians. He's been still working there ever since. And uh, the third one's an engineer, uh, I guess professional engineer. He's, uh, we, we call him our smoke sniffer. He's uh, in environmental, con environmental control, I guess they call it, in the Kalamazoo area. Uh, First daughter, Carol, is a, a, a teacher. She has her master's degree in speech pathology. And uh, she's done quite well. Uh, Patty then is the last one, the baby, uh, who just will turn 46 shortly, I think. And uh, she has three children also. And... Uh, has a daycare in her home. She taught school for a short time. Uh, when they went to, uh, when they moved to Virginia, uh, she was not able to find a job that was suitable, so she started a daycare center. And she's been doing that ever since. Well, you mentioned Patty and Carol. What were the boys' names? Thomas, David, and Dale. Very good. <clears throat> I know you, you mentioned you have a couple of grandchildren. How many grandchildren do you have? Fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> Ranging in age from? About 29 to about 10, I believe. Very <laughs> good. Tell us about uh, your working life. What was your very first job? Well, very first job was probably when I was uh, not even out of not even in high school yet. I I mowed grass for several several people during the summer. Then I got a job at the Wishing Well Inn, which was a only uh, in, in Centerville, and uh, they only they were only open Saturday night and Sunday. 
and then during the week for special occasions. Her specialty was fried chicken. If you wanted anything else, you probably couldn't get it. <laughs> but uh, what'd you do at the restaurant? I was uh, I was, when I went in there. There were four bus boys. They were all leaving for the service. I was the only one left. So for all through high school, I was the only bus boy in that in that establishment. And it was very, it was tough work. It was really, I, I never got to stop for anything. And uh, I made all the coffee. I did, uh, uh, made most of the runs to the store and everything else. I, I was just uh, all around. Uh, work, whatever they want, whatever they told me to do, I did. Well, having owned a restaurant, I know what that job <laughs> entails. Where did uh, you go from there then after high school? After high school is when I uh, interviewed for General Motors Institute, which basically, once I was accepted there, that automatically got me a job in, uh, at Frigidaire, who was going to be my sponsor. I worked there in the tool room for three months until uh, classes started. Then I had uh, four years at General Motors Institute uh, working, every, well, as I said before, school eight weeks, and then you work eight weeks, and uh, every every uh, work session was in a different department. Always very interesting and very educational. So and after graduation, where did you end up? I ended up in the data processing department. And what did you do there? Well, I handled about 300,000 cards, <laughs> punch cards, but uh, we, we worked on uh, inventory controls, what, we, what we were, our basic assignment was, and uh, then after I was there, what, maybe a year or two, I was interviewed by uh, Richard Gerstenberg, who uh, was the, I think he was at the time assistant comptroller of General Motors. Um, he was making the rounds of several divisions, recruiting people to move to Detroit to work on the new IBM 705, which at that time was the largest full, uh, largest uh, computer, the, the business computer in the, uh, that, that they made anywhere. And uh, he was looking for recruits to work on that. And he offered me a job. So we moved to Detroit. <laughs> what year was that? 19... What year? 56, yeah. Very good. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement in organizations other than Masonic. I, I know you were active in the Boy Scouts. Yes, how I got active in the Boy Scouts. I had never been a Boy Scout, but uh, after I graduated from college and uh, my brother-in-law, was the scoutmaster of the local scout troop. He was also a teacher, and he was taking a job out of out of town. And uh, he called me one day, and he said, uh, "You're the new scoutmaster." I said, "What? I don't even know what's what it's all about." So I became the new scoutmaster, and. Uh, I walked into the first scout meeting. There was about a half a dozen young men there that were, uh, they, they were older scouts, been experienced. And I sat down with them and I said, uh, 
Yes, I'm your scoutmaster, but I know nothing about scouting. You're going to have to teach me. And they did. Were any of your boys in scouting? They were all three in scouting after that. And uh, I got, got involved, in, uh, I think, 17 years of scouting that, that we got involved in. Very good. <laughs> So let's move to the Masonic fraternity. How did you first learn about uh, Masonry? When working at Frigidaire, I had two supervisors there that were active in their in the in their lodges, and uh, so they every day when they came to work, they would talk about what they had done in Masonry the night before or whatever, and uh, when. One day, and, and they were both fairly good friends. I, I got along with both of them quite well. And uh, I said, "What what what is this Masonic fraternity?" And uh, so they proceeded to tell me about it. I said, "Well, how do I get to be a member?" Well, that's all it took. <laughs> then I, I I joined in uh, Centerville, Ohio. It was a uh, just a, a fairly new lodge there, and I found out that all of the men in town that I looked up to were Masons. So that started my career in Masonry. What was the name of that lodge? Rock Mariah Lodge Number 740, Centerville, Ohio. And what year was that that you joined? 1950. 54? 54, 1954, yeah. Very good. <clears throat> Obviously, since you're a past Grand Master, you went through the officer line. At, when did you uh, transfer to Farmington Lodge? I guess we should probably go there first. 1960-something. I'm not sure exactly what the year was, but... In the 60s? She cringe. Okay. <laughs> so when you moved to Farmington, you got involved with the lodge there and... Well, we, the moved, we moved first to Detroit. Okay. And I attended the lodge a couple of times, but then when we moved to Farmington, I got involved with the lodge and transferred membership to there. And uh, eventually became a forceful master. And very active for ever since. So. Okay. <clears throat> Do you remember anything specifically about your first time as master of the lodge? Any vivid memories or recollections? No, not particularly. Uh, I know we were struggling and uh, uh, always uh, always had a money problem, but uh, but we still uh, we were able to get by, and we had a couple of good sized donations. And we uh, we got that money uh, invested, and the, the lodge is doing fairly good. Yeah. I know that you've been very active in several of the appendant affiliated bodies. Uh, tell us about some of your memberships in those bodies. Well, I had joined, before we moved to Detroit, I had joined the Royal Arch in Miamisburg, Ohio. And so when we got, uh, came back to, uh, when we moved to Farmington then, uh, I met a man that sa said, uh, so, you know, why don't you come out to North Melbourne? Royal Arch. So I did. And uh, it was, that turned out to be a very fine experience. And uh, eventually ended up as high priest of uh, a chapter there. And then uh, joined the Council of Royal Select Masons and uh, became the presiding officer of that. And then I served, then they, then they, a friend of mine, I had not joined the commander. A friend of mine at church, when I had gotten into the lodge, and he went to the York right, and he was going to join the commandery. He says, you're going with me. So I did. <laughs> he eventually served there as a commander, two different terms. And, uh, so I've been through all of it. And from there, I know you joined Scottish Rite. 
I joined Scottish Rite uh, when I was, uh, well, I be, as, as you said, I became Grand High Priest. When I was in the Grand Chapter line, uh, I joined the, East, the uh, Scottish Rite. I took most of the degrees in Detroit, because that's where I was, I was joining. But I, being Grand High Priest, I didn't have time to go to all of their affairs, so we were, the, the Grand King and I were going up to the UP for a week, a visit up there. And uh, he said, well, he said, you have most of your Scottish Rite degrees. He said, why don't you, uh, why don't you come up early and we'll just stop in Bay City. And uh, then you can complete your Scottish Rite work there before we go on to the UP. So I worked that out and we did. <laughs> Very good. I know that you've held leadership positions in several organizations. You mentioned that you were high priest and illustrious master and commander. Um, what other leadership positions have you held in affiliated and appended bodies? Well, I've been very active in DMLA. I served as the uh, I served on the International Supreme Council as an active member for uh, until I turned seventy five. They, they they kick you out at that point. But, Make you uh, emeritus. <laughs> yeah, right. But I've, of course, many there's been many appendant bodies since then. The, the one that uh, probably is uh, the one that I've done more work in than any other is York Wright Sovereign College. I got involved in that, and uh, when I was uh, Grand High, yeah, I think it was, when I was Grand High Priest. Uh, You're supposed to have the Purple Cross before you get any national or any any state or national offices. The uh, they called me one day and said, uh, "We'd like for you to be Grand Governor of Michigan." I said, "I don't even have the Purple Cross yet. We'll take care of that." <laughs> so, so they did. For and the I, benefit of our viewers who may not know, why don't you tell them what the Purple Cross is? Purple Cross is the highest honor that you can receive in the York Wright Sovereign College. It's their equivalent of the 33rd degree. Very equivalent, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> speaking of honors, I know that you've received many honors over the years. Um, tell us two or three of the ones that were most special to you or the most memorable when you received them. Well, receiving the Purple Cross was one, one of course. And uh, then I... Uh, got involved further in the international operation and served as uh, Governor General of the York Wright Sovereign College of North America, and that's all over the United States and Canada. We traveled uh, all over the U.S. and Canada for two years in, in that job, and it was a wonderful experience. Then, of course, the 33rd degree is uh, his always memorable to anybody that receives that and uh, was always, I've always been very proud of that. You had mentioned that you were an active member of the DMLA Supreme Council. Um, tell us how your activity with DMLA began. As I told you, I had never heard of DMLA until I moved to Michigan. We had, uh, our, as a family, we always did a lot of camping. We were out to a camp up in, I'm not sure, southern, northern Oakland County, I think it was, somewhere, uh, for a weekend. And there were quite a few young men uh, just wandering around camp. They, uh, most of them had uh, white shirts and, and were, were, you know, nicely dressed. And uh, so I just stopped one of them and I said, what 
uh, what are what, what's going on here? What are what are all your young men doing? He said, "Well, we are members of the Order of De Malay, and uh, we're uh, we're having an outdoor degree here tonight." I said, "What is De Malay?" So he proceeded to tell me, and uh, and I said, well, "Gee, I'd like to see that." He said, "Are you are you a Mason?" I said, "Yes, I think I am." He said, well, you'll have to prove that to our advisor, and then you'd be welcome to visit. So that was my first introduction to De Malay, and uh, was very impressed, uh, enough so that uh, after our three boys uh, were finished with uh, Boy Scouts, they all got into De Malay. The oldest one turned out to be a, a master counselor. The other two... Uh, they, they were just members. <laughs> Very good. Um, tell us about uh, some of the um, earliest grandmasters that you have recollections of. Certainly you've known a lot of grandmasters over the last several years, but some of the ones way back before you. Probably the first one that I had very much contact with was uh, Ron Schwartz. Uh, he worked in uh, down at the GM building where I worked, uh, the floor right above me, in fact. And uh, I don't know how we really got together necessarily, but uh, but he, uh, he he did a lot of uh, PR work for me over the years, and uh, and when he became uh, Grandmaster, he installed me as a, as a master, and uh, so that was, that was a good arrangement. We enjoyed him very much. Then Holmes Swinson was also a uh, good friend of mine, and I got to know him when I was Grand High Priest. In fact, he one day said. Did you ever think of running for Grand Lodge? I said, no, I never did. Well, it was quite a few years later that I finally did, but uh, but he's the one that put the seed in my head to start with. Who were some of your Masonic, ment Masonic mentors? Uh, probably Dick Sands, probably the most important. He was a Grand Master when I became Grand Marshal, and uh, he, he he's, a, he's a wonderful man, and he really, I think, uh, helped me get started on the, on the right track. Very good. <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, you had talked to Holmes Swenson, and he kind of put the thought in your, in your mind. What made you finally decide to run for Grand Lodge? Well, I retired from General Motors in 1985. Uh, got out just before Ross Perot took over the data processing, which is probably the best thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I had completely retired, and under con under the conditions of the, my retirement, I could not go back to work in any related field for, I think, two years. But uh, retired on Jan first day at home was January 1. About five days later, it was dreary and nasty outside, and we were sitting at the kitchen table, twiddling our thumbs. I looked at Mary and I said, uh, do you mind if I run for Grand Lodge? She said, no, go for it. So we did, and it was, it was a wonderful ride, believe me. So that must have been about 1984? 85? Four. Five, okay. In 1985, wasn't it? That I started? I, I think so. So as you progressed through the uh, Grand Lodge line, what were some of the highlights of that experience? Or 
some things that maybe surprised you as you were going through the line? Well, probably. Um, I think one of the highlights was uh, was getting involved in the Michigan Masonic Home. Uh, we both really took to that, I think, Mary and I. And uh, every every chance we had, we were here at the home, uh, working with the people. And then uh, I had the opportunity, well, go back. The first village estate home was built while I was a Grand Lodge officer. Uh, Ernie Hoffman was the Grand Master and that started that. And I think there was two built. And uh, then we started the uh, addition to the home, which was now the nursing section. And uh, they put me on the uh, building committee for that. And that was, since I had been at General Motors, I had been in facilities management for several years anyway. It was kind of a natural. And uh, so I was involved in the building of that facility and really enjoyed it all, all the way through. So in 1990, you became Grand Master, which is certainly an honor for any man. Oh, yes. um, tell us a little bit about your year as Grand Master, some of the things you did that year, things that stand out. Well, we started out uh, with the, uh, I'm trying to think of shrine units uh, from uh, Muslim Shrine came out. We had a, we had quite a uh, parade and a, I don't know what you, what you want to call it, but really it was a, it was, it was a lot of fun being installed. A celebration. Celebration. Yeah, that sounds good. And uh, then, uh, of course, the, there, there's... You're, there, there's so much involved in the, in the Grand Lodge line that I, I think that as you're coming up the line, you you get involved in a lot of it, but you don't really have the full responsibility until they declare you as Grand Master. Then you find out what it's really all about. And uh, it's just a tremendous amount of responsibility. At that time, we had somewhere around 100,000 Masons. 450 some lodges, I believe, and uh, I was accused of having visited every lodge in the state. I don't think that's absolutely true, but I did visit an awfully lot of them. There were times when I'd leave home on Monday morning and come back Saturday night and uh, visiting lodges. And, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. I think uh, I was able to assist a lot of those lodges that I visited in uh, getting them off their duff, as you might you might say. And, and uh, in fact, one lodge that I visited, I had recommended that they they I visited them the, that night. They didn't have enough men to open, so we sat around the table for about midnight, I think, talking about Masonry. One of the things we talked about was their finances. They didn't have any money, period. I said, okay, what would happen if you doubled your dues? Would that help? Oh, you bet it would. But we'd lose all of our members. I said, no, you won't. You do it and tell your members why you're doing it. 
and you will you'll be very surprised. The master came to me at the next Grand Lodge station and he says, that's the best advice we ever got in our life. He said, we did, we've doubled the, we've doubled the dues, we've tripled our attendance. He said, everything is going really good. That's awesome. So, <laughs> you mentioned uh, you helped them with their finance. Um, I know you've been the treasurer of several Masonic organizations. Oh, yes. How did you kind of get into that? Well, my education is in business administration with a major in accounting. So, kind of natural, I guess, that I fell into that. And that's it. I, I've enjoyed it. It's been, been a lot of fun. <clears throat> you had mentioned that you're a past grand high priest and a, gra a past grand governor of the York Wright Sovereign College. Past How governor did, general. Past governor general, I'm sorry. <laughs> How do those positions differ from that of Grand Master? Well, first of all is the number of people. Uh, they said we had around 100,000 Masons at that time. I think that uh, Royal Arch had maybe eight or 9,000, something like that. And uh, we had as many as 14,000 in the York Wright College. But uh, the Royal Arch gave me an opportunity to travel all over Michigan uh, and meet an awfully lot of Masons. And uh, we were, and, and that was, it wasn't the same experience. You don't have the responsibility that you have as grandmaster. Nothing does. But it was, uh, but it was very good experience, uh, very rewarding and uh, educational. Then the York Wright College, as I said, it's all over the United States and Canada, and uh, you, you get to meet the leaders in masonry everywhere you go. And we travel all over. And well, while we're on New York Wright College, since I don't think we've discussed this in any of our previous interviews, why don't you tell our viewers what the York Wright Sovereign College is? Well, the York Wright Sovereign College, in order to become a member of the college, you have to be in, you have to be a member of all of the York Wright bodies, Royal Arch, Council, and the Commandery, and be invited then to join the York Wright College. And uh, the basic basics of the York Wright College is that it's formed to assist and uh, enhance or in all of York Wright Masonry. Some colleges do a good job of it, some don't. But that's the, that's, that's the, was the original basis. It was formed here in Michigan. And, uh, what, 55, 56 years ago now, probably. And, uh, most of the men that, uh, that, that formed that, I were, I knew, I didn't, uh, I can't say that. I, that they were all good friends, but I knew all most of them, and uh, it was formed basically in Michigan, Ontario, and Ohio to start with. Then uh, it it has expanded from there into every province and every state of the in, in North America. The last one to uh, kind of interesting because uh, Ohio was one of the founding uh, colleges, if you will, had two or three colleges in Ohio. And somehow one of the Grand Masters uh, uh, decided that uh, that wasn't a good thing for Ohio and uh, made it illegal to belong. And that was uh, I don't know, 17, 18 years, something like that, I believe, that uh, that stood. 
when I uh, became governor general, I said, we're going to get Ohio back in the, the fold. And we did. It was a lot of work. And, uh, but, but, but very gratifying. And uh, then, of course, as I said, the, the, once you uh, are a member, you can, uh, you can receive the Purple Cross, which is probably the high, it, it's equivalent, as you said, to the 33rd. And uh, very limited as to the number of people that, that receive that. And uh, then, uh, then, and then, of course, you, you go from there and to uh, become a, eventually get, if, you, if you're active enough, you get elected a regent and uh, an officer and go from there. So. Very good. <clears throat> Going to the fraternity in general, um, what do you think the fraternity needs to do to grow and prosper? I think one of the biggest problems in our fraternity is that we do not charge enough money. When I joined Rock Moria Lodge, the fee to join was $120. Okay. It doesn't sound like much today. But I, had, I was out of college. I had a good job. I was making $408 a month. A month. So $120 was a big chunk of money. It's a week's pay. A week's pay. <coughs> so it, you, you really had to think about it. You really had to want it. And you had to sacrifice to become a Mason. Today, most of those lodges still don't charge even $100. And, when, and the candidate can reach in his pocket and pull out the money and have money left. That 120 today would be in purchasing power would take would be somewhere around two thousand dollars at least. Should we raise the fund and raise the do the fees to two thousand dollars? That would be very difficult. But we really should work on getting them up to a realistic figure that means something to the people that are joining. And I think that would make a world of difference. If we don't put value on it, nobody else will. That's right. What advice would you give somebody that was thinking about joining the fraternity? What would you tell them? Well, I would say first that uh, you need to really commit yourself to the fraternity. Uh, your family comes first and your job, of course. But beyond that, you need to commit yourself to the fraternity. You need to get involved. If you just take the degrees and walk away from it, you've wasted your time and your money. What would you tell somebody that's a, a new master, a young master of a lodge? What, what advice would you give him to make his year a success? I guess uh, the first thing you better do is some planning for the year, which they don't all do. And uh, once you get your plan, get get your plan, then you need to work that plan and make sure that everybody in the lodge knows what that plan is. And uh, stick stick to it. Uh, you will get arguments from some of the old timers and things of that nature, but you uh, must remember that you are the master and you have the gamble. <laughs> That's exactly right. <clears throat> if uh, a Mason came to you and, and said he was thinking about running for Grand Lodge, what would you uh, tell him? Hmm. Well, Oh, that is a good question. <laughs> uh, 
I guess I would, first thing I would tell him is how much time are you willing to, to commit to the fraternity? Because this is, it is basically a full-time job from the day you become Grand Marshal. It is a full-time job and you must be fully committed to doing that or just forget it. It's a, it's a great experience. It's an experience that will change your life forever. I would agree with that. Tell us how masonry has impacted your life. Well, I'm not sure. It's been my life <laughs> for, for, for many, many years. Uh, Mary and I both have enjoyed all of our activities in the fraternity. We've enjoyed the people. I don't, I don't know that we have if, we, if, if there are any, there's very few people that we can call friends that are not Masons. So in that respect, it's, uh, it's been our life. Any uh, final reflections on the fraternity? Anything you'd like to tell the viewers? Well, as I said, Masonry is a, is a wonderful experience. It has been our life. Uh, we, we've had the opportunity to travel all over the United States and Canada, England, France, South Africa. Wherever we go, we find that Masons are people that we enjoy being with. They are wonderful people. And it's just it's just a wonderful life. That's all I can say. I know. That's, that's excellent. Actually, I'm going to ask one more question that wasn't on my list. <clears throat> but uh, you and Mary recently became residents of the Masonic Home Pathways. Yes. Um, and I know that you're very happy with that decision. Tell us a little bit about life at Pathways. Well, of course, we, we were always active, very active in, uh, in Farmington, where we lived. But uh, we, we decided quite a few years ago, well, to go back. I said, when, when, when uh, I was a Grand Lodge officer, we spent a lot of time up here. We were involved in uh, the uh, construction, not too much of the village estates, but then involved in the construction of the nursing section and uh, we, we en enjoyed the people. Uh, Mary always came with me and she, she did more visiting than I could do because I was always tied up in meetings and things and she got to enjoy the people. And uh, we, we, I think at that point we said someday we're going to move there. And uh, we got to the point where the uh, upkeep on it, we lived in our house in Farmington for 53 years. And I always had a nice big garden and things of that nature. And, but it got to the point where neither one of us really were keeping things up the way it should be. Uh, the last year that I had the garden was a real struggle. And uh, so we just, I don't know, we just decided it was time. And uh, so we did. And it, uh, we've, it, it's been a great, it's been a great experience too. We've enjoyed living here. We enjoy all the people. We enjoy the activities. It, uh, and, uh, and we enjoy the, re enjoy the relaxing. <laughs> it's uh, terrible to have to sit there and watch them mow the grass and clear the snow off and wash your windows and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, today they're out there uh, working on, re starting to uh, work on replacing the 
shingles that were blown off in that wind that we had a couple weeks ago. So it's, you know, there's nothing to worry about. You just enjoy your, just get to the point where you enjoy life. That's great. And it's a great are. place to live. It is. Wayne, on behalf of the Foundation, uh, we'd like to thank you for participating in our Oral History Project. And we'd also like to thank you for everything that you've done to uh, promote and grow our fraternity.